Hello, Haunters, and welcome back to the Salawog's Whites Creek Gut Reaction. I'm your host, the Salawog, and on this show, I watch things and react from the gut. Welcome to the new abode. The Salawog has finally moved out of his parents' house. Is he an adult now? That is still in question. Definitely don't look at my toy wall. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to kick off this new abode with a review on one of my favorite films of all time, Christopher Nolan's Memento. Memento stars Guy Pearce, Carrie Ann Moss, and Joey Pantoliano. Carrie Ann Moss and Joey Pants had just done The Matrix prior to doing this movie, and Guy Pearce is a name you may know. He's been in some pretty big things. I think his last big movie was Lockout, which was like a space diehard type of movie. And, uh, but he's also been in movies like Hurt, Hurt Locker and, uh, What's that called? Uh, L.A. Yeah. L.A. Noir. I might be getting that wrong, but yeah, this is just a great film. It's Christopher Nolan's second feature film, and it's his first major success. It's the film he did prior to Insomnia, which is a couple movies away from the Dark Knight trilogy, which most of you are familiar with. So, if you're a fan of the Dark Knight trilogy, if you're especially a fan of the Dark Knight, and if you're especially a fan of the Two-Face plotline, storyline, in The Dark Knight, then just pull that Two-Face aspect of The Dark Knight out, and we'll splatter that and make that an entire movie. Because essentially that's what Memento was. Memento was about a man who suffers from brain damage, he... Uh, was assaulted while defending his wife from an assault during a home invasion, and it left him with brain damage that gave him short-term memory loss. So throughout this movie, we don't know how long ago that event was. But he's essentially trying to catch the guy who attacked his wife. And the problem is, he has all these notes and all of this stuff, but he can't hold on to any memory for too long. He can stay focused for a certain period of time, but if he gets distracted, if anything gets too complicated and he loses sight of his thoughts, then it's done. So that is the challenge about this movie. And Joey Pants plays this uh, officer who is kind of trying to lead Guy Pierce around, and Carrie Ann Moss is this bartender who seems to be helping out Guy Pierce, but she may have ulterior motives. And the truth is, this movie is about a lot of different things, but one of the upfront issues brought up is how people might take advantage of someone who has this problem. And especially as this is a revenge plot movie. You know, what's interesting about this movie, it's a it's a revenge plot. So he's out to he's out to murder the guy who essentially sexually assaulted his wife and killed her right before his eyes, before he himself was struck in the head. So he's out on this mission, but he can't remember anything, and he's relying heavily on the people that are around him, but he doesn't know how long he's known these people. He doesn't know what these people really want from him. And you find with every single character, there's some level of duplicitousness and some level of taking advantage of. And... You know, this is very, I think this is very real life. I think in real life, people can't help but take advantage of those who are either A, offering it, or B, an opportunity that they see. They, just, they can't help it. They see something, they're going to take it. They're going to do it. That's what people do a lot of the time, which makes it very hard to trust people, even as a full, fully functioning person with memories. Now, I'm a stoner, so I don't quite count, but you know what I mean? That's kind of what this movie is dealing with. Now, this movie, its strangest quality is actually this presentation of timeline. Because the movie is essentially played backwards. We have a black and white sequence, which is just Leonard Shelby, Guy Pierce, in his hotel room. He's shaving, he's taking care of himself, and you kind of hear this voiceover where he's describing his routine... And how he essentially gets through his life by leaving himself notes to remind himself, hey, shave, take a shower, you know, go, go to this bar, go to a hotel, you know. He leaves himself these notes to remind himself what he's supposed to do. And 
that actually moves in linear fashion. So throughout this whole movie, you do have one chunk of story that's moving in a, in a forward motion that you can track. But the in-color sequences, which take up the majority of the movie, are all about Leonard Shelby going out on his missions. It's kind of, it's almost Grand Theft auto -y, you know, without the excessive violence. Just take all the excessive violence out of Grand Theft Auto, and basically that's what Leonard Shelby's up to. He's kind of on all these little side quests, trying to complete the main mission. And But those are to told backwards, so you get the ending of his mission at the start of the movie and you get the beginning of his mission at the end of the movie so it's very twisted so you already know the outcome right in the first second of the movie the the very opening shot of the movie is leonard shooting joey pants in the head and the very following scene is the scene that builds up to him shooting joey pants in the head and the very next, in, and again, these are broken up by the black and white scenes. So it'll be, bam! What? Why did that just happen? Black and white. Hmm, I'm just in my hotel room. Why am I here? What am I doing? Back to color. You, you killed my wife. Bam! And then, whew, back in my hotel room. I think I have to shave. And then, Huh, I think I have the information on the guy who killed my wife. <laughs> you know, and that's how this movie is kind of structured. It's very, it's interesting. It's a very inter interesting structure to this movie. And I, uh, it's kind of addictive because essentially the movie does this job of putting the audience in the subjective perspective. And this is not me saying it. This is Christopher Nolan himself explaining these things in the commentary and in interviews. <sighs> Christopher Nolan himself says the, the goal is to put the audience in the subjective experience of the main character. How can you get an audience to relate to the main character if you're telling the story completely in linear fashion? Uh, because he can't remember anything he's doing anyway. And it's one of the big lines in the movie is like, sometimes I'm angry, but I don't know why. Sometimes I feel guilty, but I don't know why. I can do anything and not know why. I feel... A reaction to it five seconds later and that's his struggle throughout this movie is making sure that however he feels he's comfortable with that choice in the next five seconds because he's not going to remember what he just did and it's there's so many layers to this character and so many things going on in this movie it's such a juicy and good movie i, I just highly recommend it uh spoiler free without spoiling too much i mean it's that that is just what I would say is such a great experience to this movie. You have to be ready for a bit of a brain teaser because this movie on the first watch is very confusing because you're just trying to track all the connecting points. Now the beautiful thing is every color scene will have a loop point that the next color scene will connect back to. So at least your brain will have a train of thought to go, oh, okay, so this is before that and this is before that. And you see movies do this from time to time, and, and they may do it sometimes because of Memento as, as an influence. But in this movie, they do a really good job of, you know, when you hit that loop point, it's the exact same take, and it's the exact same angle, it's the exact same shot. Because you oftentimes when movies do this, you know, post-Memento, they'll use a different take or something, and you can always tell. TV shows do it all the time. When they cut to commercial and they come back and they use a different take and the voice sounds totally different. And it's just like, well, why did you do that? I, I mean, did you think I'm not going to know? I, I mean, all I'm doing is watching what's presented to me. I'm going to notice this. Uh, you know, you, even if your audience wants to be stupid, they're not stupid. Uh, I like my action movies big and dumb. Dumb, 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 dumb. Well, that tells me who you are. And... Uh, Anyway, no, but this movie, you know, this is a romantic quest type of movie. This is a revenge quest. But it's also just such an interesting breakdown of a scenario that someone could be in. And uh, to watch Guy Pierce play the struggle and watch him break down and have quiet moments, it's like he's permanently stuck as this little boy 
even though he was an adult, even though he's an adult, but he's permanently stuck in this sort of state of innocent drift because he just has no idea what's going on, even if he's the one motivating the events that have occurred in the last five minutes. It's, it's just engaging. And to have all that emotion come out throughout this movie... I mean, his in interactions with Carrie Ann Moss, it's like you'll spend half this movie shipping them, and then you'll straight up... Uh, you'll spend half this movie shipping them, and then you'll spend the other half hoping to God he gets as far away from her as possible. And I'm not going to tell you why. But, uh, I mean, again, that's the problem with this whole movie, is that... And not the problem, but the problem for Guy Pierce is that there's no one that he can trust. And especially because he thrusts himself into these situations and how, you know, if you're not going to put yourself in a home or something where people can consistently watch you and help you, yeah, you're definitely, you know, in shark infested waters. So it's kind of this sort of sad reality experience of, of how people behave and how people treat each other. Uh, I mean, I think even if you take out the memory aspect, I think issues of people taking advantage of one another is huge. Um, and having ulterior motives or, or having something selfish that they're going for that they're trying to just get out of someone else. I mean, that's just very real stuff. You know, the movie doesn't pull its punches in those aspects. But it also shows how those people can even achieve that. And the truth is, people are still multi-layered. So even though these people may be taking advantage of Leonard one way or another, you'll see that they have these colors and shades of sympathy for him, and they kind of do feel bad that he's in this situation. But at the same time, he's making choices that are affecting them, which complicates how they even think they should feel about him. And... You really don't get that knowledge until the ending. Now, what I would say about this movie, without getting into too many spoilers, because uh, that's for later, what I would say about this movie that makes it worth talking about in terms of, you know, why is it great, what makes it a strong entry as a piece of storytelling, uh, what's a unique either technical or academic aspect to appreciate about this movie is that essentially the spoiler is up front. So you know the end of the mission is the first scene in the movie. So you know he gets the guy. You know, the first five minutes of this movie is him getting the guy that he's after. But it's not till the last ten minutes of the movie that you figure out why he's trying to get the guy. So you're really building up to a, this huge reveal, but the truth is that you already know the outcome before you know the answer. So it's kind of like Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet spoils the story up front. Two star-crossed lovers from two warring families fall in love and commit suicide. Literally, the whole story is told up front at the beginning of the story, at the beginning of that play. And here, Memento does the same thing. It says, this story is told backwards, this guy gets the guy he's going for. But you don't know why. You don't know how. And by that factor alone, that tells you what storytelling really is. You know, people get in a big whoop about the big reveal or surprises. What really matters is how good your story actually is. What storytelling you have to come out of you in order to tell something of quality. Uh, you have to have a story itself. And the story of Leonard Shelby is the struggle to maintain some sense of purpose and latitude in life when he has this huge disability. Uh, and watching that struggle as he's on this mission is, is what's fascinating. And so when you get the answer, that's it's so satisfying because you've watched him go through, through this emotional and intellectual struggle throughout the entire film. Uh, but you watch him go through that knowing that he achieves his goal anyway. So you know that he's going to achieve his goal. So it works even though you know the ending.
but you don't know the ending ending. And much like Romeo and Juliet, even though you know the ending, you don't know how you get there. You watch those two characters meet and fall in love. And you just see all the struggle, all the emotional struggle and toll it takes between them and their families. Everything that leads up to that moment. You, have, you don't actually know the how it happens. And when you get to the end of Romeo and Juliet, like with Memento, when all these twists and turns happen and all these character emotions and choices are made, when all of that stuff happens... And you actually get to those final moments of the story. That's what gets you. It's that that proper storytelling. That uh, what matters most is having a story to tell in the first place. And I think a lot of movies try to get caught up in the pomp and circumstance of the twists and reveals. As if that really matters. But the twists and reveals only matter if the story is interesting in the first place. You could spoil the whole movie in the first five seconds as long as the way you tell it. And not, it's not just the way you tell it. Because, you know, Spider-Man No Way Home is well told. But there's not really a quality story going on there. It's a very superficial... All of these Tom Holland movies are very well told and well made. But there's not a good core story there. So it doesn't really matter. It's kind of just a filler. And I mean, no offense to Tom Holland or Marvel, but that is the experience of what you're getting the popcorn, uh, but you're not really getting any real meat. The, the Tobey Maguire movies were all meat. They were all storytelling. Everything that happened was about getting that character to transform and turn and change by the end of that movie. So again, that's what the strength is of Christopher Nolan as a storyteller is that he understands these principles. He knows that you can spoil the movie up front as long as the way you tell that story... Again, it's not about the way you tell it exactly. It's about the content to which you actually have something to say in the way that you're telling it. You know, they say it's not the idea, it's the execution. But exactly how are you going to execute anything without an idea? That really... You know, some phrases are just things people say to make themselves sound smart because they don't like something or whatever like that. <laughs> But the truth is, it's it really is about having a good core concept in the first place that generates your execution. Because the core concept here was to tell this riveting story about a man uh, with all these issues, but to also tell it in a way that gets the audience to experience it. You see, the idea is what generates the execution. And that is what Memento exemplifies. Memento exemplifies it in the exact same way as William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Or for me, Wilmy, or for me, William and Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet, because that's how I was introduced to that story. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Claire. Uh, but that's what's so strong about this movie, is that you're going to feel something even though you kind of know the spoiler up front at the beginning of the movie. But the truth is, there's still more to reveal. And that's what good storytelling is. That by the end of Memento, when you get some real details on the background of Leonard, about how long it's been since the event, and you actually get a lot of information at the end of this movie, him learning about himself is the hardest part of the movie. And it's the hardest thing for him to deal with. And even if you know the twist, this is the strength of this movie. Even if you get to this, the end of this movie, and, and somehow you, you know, the experience of getting there is so good. And even when you're there at the end of this movie, learning the twist and learning everything that you didn't want to know about this guy. Once you get there, watching him deal with it and grip with it. And having the time to take that in, it's just so well done. It's so well performed. The sheer experience of this movie from beginning to end is so raw and good and interesting and engaging. You know, it, it makes the movie so watchable from top to bottom. You know, Christopher Nolan really admits to writing this script a little more intellectually and that Guy Pierce himself was the one who brought the emotion in. 
that the actors brought the emotion in that made it just more palatable and more accessible. Uh, but he essentially, Nolan, kind of created the structure that made the movie. So, yeah, I just think stuff like that is what, what makes movies great. What makes movies great is that the artists, that the craftsmen behind the camera understand what's important in telling their story. I think uh, in reviews there is a lot of compare and contrast with other movies. I think that is fair to a certain extent. But what Memento exemplifies is that good storytelling and good filmmaking comes down to one thing. And it's about what I said, coming down to the, the idea that generates the structure. Your movie isn't good because it follows the rules of another movie. Unless it's a sequel. Your movie is good because it, it follows the rules of, its, of itself. The, the movie starts off with a certain set of rules, and it's like a game. It says, these are the rules, you know. Superman can't see through lead. Kryptonite makes him weak. Okay. So by the end of the movie, if Kryptonite isn't making Superman weak, then something's wrong. Something's seriously wrong. But... You know, if and if he can see through lead, then okay, you're not following your own rules. You're breaking the rules just to make the movie end. I mean, a lot of movies do that. Blockbusters do that left and right, where they make all these little cheat codes for themselves just to work themselves out of the problems they got into. But this movie sets up rules that are so strong and so hard and fast and clear that essentially, you know, there's two sections in this movie where. Leonard Shelby can actually remember what's going on for a good amount of time. Uh, now, it's not that long of a time, but it's long enough. Uh, but that's important because that's sort of him following through with his own rules that he establishes. As long as I can stay focused on what I'm thinking about, as long as I can stay focused, I can follow what's going on. And so there's two points in the movie where he can do that. And in those are the crucial points. One is in the middle, and the other is at the end. And that's where the big reveal comes in, and, and that's what... And the ending is actually the beginning, and that's what motivates the whole story that we see that goes to the beginning of this movie. Now, that being said, now I'm, I'm still not getting into spoilers because I really want you to see this movie. But I want to talk about it in as much a way as possible. You can still get kind of the essential essence of the movie without having to watch it. Uh, you know, structure-wise. Now, people like to just say, oh, well, that's just clever editing. That you wrote this movie in order, and then you chopped it up, and then moved it around, and all this stuff. And, and even if Christopher Nolan did that. Certain things have to be done in screenwriting in order to make a script considered good, in order to make something understandable to the audience. And if you watch this movie, even though this is a story told backwards, we still get exposition at the front of the movie and in order. Uh, because throughout this movie, Leonard Shelby does not have to explain his memory issue uh, throughout the entire movie. He, I mean, he does in ways, but it, it essentially gets shorter and shorter and shorter, and ultimately people just start saying, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Uh, and so it's, it's cool. So even though it's a story told backwards, essentially the ending should be where he's saying it the most, but he says it the most in the beginning. And that's for the audience. The audience is given what they need to know at the front of the, of the movie, because that's where that information is supposed to go. Because you need to know the rules of the game you're playing up front. That I have a memory problem. I can't remember what just happened. Why I'm feeling this way. And and uh, this is why. You learn the exact why a little bit later. But uh, all of that work is very important. You know, it's very important to know exactly when your exposition is to go. So even though the story has a mixed up timeline, you're not just leaving the exposition at the end of the movie to explain the rules because that's editing. You know, that that would be editing. 
story structure happens from the screenplay. It starts from the screenplay. And, you know, as Christopher Nolan said, like, every scene leads to the next scene. So I, I think he said there's either little or no deleted scenes because every single scene was crucial in motivating the next scene. And that's what's important in storytelling is that every scene should matter. You know, I think about that first X-Men movie by Ryan Singer. I still really appreciate that movie. I think that was a great effort. But I remember watching those deleted scenes and, and you know, the filmmakers would kind of have a soft heart about it and be like, ah, you know, I really liked this scene, but the truth was it wasn't necessary to the story. And that right there. If you want scenes to stay in a movie they have to be crucial to the story don't even write a scene if it's not crucial to the story even if it's an atmospheric scene it should have something to do with the character's development because there are some nice quiet character scenes for leonard but they are all part of his experience and his experience is what's getting him to the end of the movie and even his more atmospheric scenes where he's just kind of there's a scene where he's taking his wife's stuff out and he's burning it and, and he's out, you know, he's out in some crummy ruin area. And even though that doesn't further the plot, it does further his character development. It shows you that he's trying to get over his wife. He's trying to get over his loss. He just won't remember that he did this. And that's the tragedy. But he is actively trying to deal with his emotions and his pains that... He is going through this constantly because, as he says in the movie, the last thing he remembers is his wife dying. So every time he wakes up, every time he snaps into the present, the last thing he remembered was her face as she died. And so he's constantly in a sense of dazed tragedy. And that's, that's what this guy is dealing with. Like I said... It's just like the Harvey Dent aspect of The Dark Knight. I didn't lie. It's all there. So, yeah. I mean, spoiler free, Memento is just incredibly well constructed. And it understands the rules of filmmaking and the rules of storytelling. Christopher Nolan's first successful feature and his, sec his second feature, but his first big hit feature. And those really are the, the technical academic reasons why. It's important to understand that if you're getting into filmmaking and you're getting into storytelling, I definitely feel, looking especially at blockbusters now, the overwhelming reliance on reviewers, YouTube reviewers, all this stuff, like audience reactions. I think all that stuff is useful to a point. You don't get a movie like Memento because Christopher Nolan is worrying about what some YouTube guy is thinking or worried, you know, back in Siskel and Ebert days. You don't get a movie like that if if some guy is worried about what some reviewer thinks about his movie, so he changes his movie to be more palatable to a very specific voice that only applies to about 30,000 people who agree with them. Or 3,000. Or 100. Or just the five people who watch my program. You don't get a movie like Memento because you're worried about what the audience thinks. You should only be worried about does the audience grasp what's going on and do they grasp what they need to grasp in order to follow and keep going. Like that, that is number one. I think filmmaking by committee has its place, but if you want to achieve higher art if you want to achieve the best that you can achieve you have to have a clear vision an idea that springs forth the structure and everything else that 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 you want and memento is 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 that type of film i say memento and devil's backbone are, are two of my favorite early works of directors i think they're just classics they're they're instant classics as soon as you see them as soon as they come out they're just so well done and it's you know 
I'm a blockbuster dude. That's where I where I started with my love of movies. But these blockbuster guys, they they have indie hearts. The 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 best ones have indie hearts. They understand what makes a good movie. Starts with the character and all that stuff, and the entertainment aspects are uh, they should be part of the storytelling, not not the goal of the storytelling. And I think the best blockbusters in older times understood that as well. That yes, you need entertainment value. Yes, you need all that stuff. But it should still be coming out of, of the journey of that character. The, the, the journey is the goal. That's what you're trying to show in a movie. Uh, a movie is a painting that you get to walk into and then walk out of. And Memento, Memento is that. Devil's Backbone is that. Devil's Backbone, Guillermo del Toro. Nightmare Alley. Del, del Toro just came out with Nightmare Alley, and I think Nightmare Alley is his best film since Devil's Backbone. Not to say he didn't have amazing work that definitely other people prefer as their favorite, but my personal favorite, Nightmare Alley, I think achieves what he achieved with, with Devil's Backbone. To, to knock you out with, with as little special effects as possible. And yeah. So, but anyway, we're talking about Memento. I just really loved this movie from top to bottom. Uh, Joey Pants plays so many levels as well. Between being suspicious to also being friendly. To sometimes feeling like maybe he's the only guy who has Leonard Shelby's back. Even though, well... Leonard Shelby shot him for a reason. You, you have to watch the movie to find out. But stuff like that. And then Carrie Ann Moss, again, like all these levels of like, man, I, I kind of feel for this guy, but at the same time, uh, and you have to watch why. So that's what I have to say about Memento, spoiler free, because I want you to see this movie. It's a movie that deserves to be watched all the way through uh, without someone spoiling it for you. Uh, thank you for watching. Check out Christopher Nolan's other works. I highly recommend The Prestige. The Prestige is, again, like one of my favorite Nolan pictures. I still think Memento and uh, Prestige are are Nolan's best outside the Dark Knight trilogy. Uh, you know, definitely Dunkirk was pretty damn good, but uh, I don't know. There was something about those those particular entries. All of his work is great, but. But there's something about those particular entries I just feel like there's a rawness and a crudeness that that feels so real, that feels so tangible. You know, it, it's worth celebrating for, for how good and fresh it is. That what you can do with so little is, is, is powerful. So anyway, that's my recommendation for the week. Welcome to the new abode and catch you next time. Why did I make that sound? Aloha.